All right, so I think that we will get started here then. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our substrate focused editions um, of the Getting Into the Wheat series. Uh, my name is Talia Plaskett. I am the Protective Crop Specialist at Perennia, and I will be your host for today. Um, and joining me is Sonny Murray, uh, who is the Barrow Specialist here at Perennia, um, and he is going to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Um, so before we get started, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we have a lot of good information lined up for you, and I'm excited to be able to share that. Um, so before we really get started here, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, all participants have had their audio and video turned off, so you don't have to worry about frantically looking for those buttons. Um, we have a Q&A feature and we have a chat function, um, so you can use either of those to submit your questions throughout the webinar, and we will address those questions um, at the end. Um, also, this presentation is going to be recorded and we will upload it at a later date. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Perennia, um, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about us. Um, so our vision is that uh, Nova Scotia is recognized as a world leader in producing innovative, environmentally responsible, and safe food of impeccable quality. Um, the mission is to support growth, transformation, and economic development in Nova Scotia's agriculture, seafood, and food and beverage sectors. Pernia is a multifaceted company. So for example, this workshop is a part of the Agriculture Field Services uh, Division. Um, in field services, we offer production advice, disease and pest identification and management, help address emerging and critical industry issues, develop workshops and other training modules, do research, and help producers uh, be environmentally and economically sustainable. Uh, we also have our food safety team um, who help producers and processors meet their food safety goals through training and on-site assessments. Our product development team has been doing some really cool things with businesses in Nova Scotia, assisting in creating new products, fine-tuning processes, improving shelf life, etc. Uh, there's also the Agri-Food Accelerator Program, which is designed for current and aspiring agri-food and beverage businesses in Nova Scotia, um, which supports commercialization and access to new markets. Uh, <clears throat> Perennia is also has also started offering some lab services. So we have a plant health lab that is working with the grape and small fruit industries to do virus testing. And we also have a cannabis lab based in Churro that provides analytical services. Uh, the minister has also asked that we expand our mandate into the fishery sector. And so we have undertaken some initiatives in that area as well. Um, and so for those of you who have not seen the Minister of Agriculture digital series, uh, take notes of the uh, dates listed on here for some interesting and relevant topics to the industry. Similarly, we have a digital series focused towards the Nova Scotia seafood industry as well. Um, and for more information on either of these sessions or uh, the links to register, check out our website, perennia.ca. All right, so with that, we are ready to dive into our webinar on substrates. Um, today's session is going to be valuable for people who are new to growing in substrate, but also those who are currently producing in the system. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so there's a lot more that meets the eye when it comes to growing in substrate, uh, and we can hopefully address some of those things today. Also, we do have uh, CEU credits available for today's session. Uh, those codes will be shared at the end of the talk. So joining us today, uh, we have Dennis Wilson, and he is the Managing Director and Senior Berry Fruit Agronomist for Delphi UK. Uh, he has 35 years of professional experience in berry production, uh, acting as a farm manager, a researcher, and an agronomist. Dennis was involved in the first commercial strawberry and raspberry substrate production projects in the UK in 1991, and is well versed in the challenges in transitioning into and managing a soilless production system. Um, so with that, I am going to pass things off to Dennis. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about substrates, um, how it's different from growing in soil, the way that substrates are manufactured, and the difference in the physical composition between soil, and now how that affects the way that we grow, but also in the, the formation of the root system, and how sensitive um, plants grown in substrate are compared to those grown in soil, and that will affect the irrigation 
requirements of the plants. And we'll deal with that in more detail as we go through the uh, second seminar, but I'll introduce that um, in this seminar. So first of all, which crops are transitioning into substrates? So we see over the last 50 years, there's been an increasing move away from soil growing to growing in substrate. And that started in the 1970s and primarily in the Western area of Holland, but quickly spread globally, um, mainly in the crops that were grown in that region, tomatoes, cucumbers, and to a lesser degree, peppers and aubergines. And what we see, um, those were originally plants grown under intensive glasshouse conditions. Um, and as a result of that, then we see virtually all glasshouse um, vegetable salad crops in a non-organic uh, growing regime now being grown in substrate. Very little soil production worldwide for intensive production under glass and polythene. And over the last 20 years, this move to substrate production has been followed by field and glasshouse growers and many other crops. And the ones where it's particularly dominant now as things like berry fruits. So it's my specialist area, if you want to call it strawberries, caneberries and blueberries. And there's you see a picture of a nice tabletop strawberry crop. Quite a lot of flowers, roses, gerbera, orchids, tulips, a number of other ones. This is a picture of a, excuse me, solid argo, a yellow flower and substrate. Cannabis has been quite a huge growth area, both medicinal and recreational over the last uh, five or 10 years. And crops like lettuce and many other leafy salad crops have moved out of soil. Unlike most of the other crops that I've mentioned, these are more grown in hydroponic water-based growing systems rather than the substrate itself. Um, but it's important to realize that they've moved out of soil. So I'm gonna concentrate on the, if you wanna call it the substrate rather than purely water-based um, aspects of growing. And we'll talk through the different materials, their physical properties, and how they're altered to make the right substrate for different crops. So what's driving this move into substrate growing? So there's lots of different factors, and there may be local growing conditions, it may be specific crop issues. So I've got a long list of um, the um, different um, aspects, and I'll skip briefly through it. There is a PDF um, of this presentation that will be available, so you can refer to that at your leisure and also to the recording as well. So first and foremost, then we have the loss of um, soil sterilants. So when we're in an intensive growing situation in soil, it's virtually impossible after a few years to replant without disinfecting that soil um, to prevent uh, what we call replant disease from pathogens like verticillium or fusarium or phytophthora. But in many countries, particularly in Europe, um, Northern Europe, where uh, I'm operating and a large glasshouse um, industry operates, then um, growers have faced the loss of virtually all the effective soil sterilants. So that's prompted the move into growing out of soil altogether because there's no easy or efficient way of stopping pathogens affecting their crops. For other situations, then, um, they might not be the right soil type. So crops like blueberries, they require specific soil and chemical conditions. And in many crops, when we start to grow intensively, even with sterilization, we see reductions in soil organic matter and physical structure. So we soon see yields declining if you're growing in the same glasshouse or polytunnel year after year. And as profit margins decrease, and uh, because of higher costs and virtually static prices, then the growers are generally needing to intensify to stay in business. So because we can get a more guaranteed yield certainty and generally higher yields in substrate and a faster and easier turnaround, then the whole process of moving out of soil into substrate becomes much more attractive. For some crops like strawberries grown at ground level, then growers quickly realize that in addition to these benefits, we see a reduction in harvesting costs. You move the crop to the workers rather than the workers having to bend down to pick the crop. 
and productivity, labour productivity, massively increases. We see picking costs reduced by up to 50%. So again, that almost pays for the introduction of a tabletop system in itself. Um, for other crops that I specialise in, uh, raspberries and blackberries, we see that growing in a smaller container means that we've got more control over the plants and the costs associated with managing that plant, with despawning, sucker control, weeding, etc. So there's lots of other benefits, um, as well as the freedom from pests and diseases, etc. But um, we see that with this freedom from pests and diseases, better control of the plants, better water and nutrient management, we get better yields, we get better quality. It's something that has been said to me many, many times before when people were transitioning from soil into substrate, the best crops on my farms are the ones growing in substrate. And the other more interesting thing that's coming to light with recent research shows that when you compare water and nutrient use um, per cropped area between soil grown crops and some research that was literally just published on tomatoes has compared soil with different types of substrate growing systems in greenhouse tomatoes. Then we see they use less water per cropped area, less fertilizer per cropped area. And bear in mind, we're getting higher yields. So in terms of their resource efficiency, water and fertilizer per kilo of produce, they're much more efficient compared to a soil grown crop. So all these um, factors are driving growers to move quite substantially to substrate. One of the great and important features to recognize in substrate when we start thinking about how we're going to grow the crop is that once we grow in a container, we're miniaturizing the root system. We can't have that free root run. And here's a good example with raspberries. And actually, this picture was taken in my garden. So um, we've got some raspberries, three years old, um, grown at six floricanes per meter, which is a standard density for commercial raspberries um, in many countries. Picture of the same plantation early in the year. The dog is there for scale rather than anything else. But what you can see is that root suckers are emerging two meters from the original canes. So that plant has got a vast root system. The raspberries themselves, like um, many other berry crops, evolved to grow on the forest floor. And you know you can say conservatively, they've got a rooting depth of two to two and a half feet, 60 to 75 centimeters. And you can see we can get a spread of three to four meters from um, one, uh, if you want to call it far left, um, side of the root system to the far right side of the root system. So with some back of the cigarette packet calculations, we can say that, OK, we've got around about 2.64 cubic um, metres of soil for our entire um, uh, linear metre. So if we divide that by six canes per linear metre, we're talking about 440 litres of root volume available to that plant. When we go into substrate, by comparison, is a very typical plantation, seven and a half litres. And in that, we've got two canes. So we've got three and a half litres of substrate per cane, rather than the 440 litres. So we've got less than 1% of the root volume that a soil crop can occupy. But the leaf area, is similar. In fact, quite often, it's a bit more in substrate. We can get a more leafy plant if we water and feed it correctly. So basically, we're asking that plant to be massively more efficient with its root system than one grown in the soil. We've got a huge increase in the demand and the uptake of water and nutrients from that tiny root system. And the only way that we can do that is to um, irrigate on what we call a little and often basis. That crop will dry that pot out completely in 20 minutes if we don't irrigate it on a hot day. So we're moving towards um, growing with a probably more wasteful system of water and nutrients in soil to a more efficient system, but one that makes much higher demands 
on people's growing skills. And that's a really important thing to understand when we make that change from soil to substrate growing. So if we're growing in a container, we want to get out of soil, then I'm often asked the question, well, why don't we just use soil in a container? We can clean up the soil or we could amend the soil to make a nice substrate. And that's perfectly true, you can. But as you can imagine, there's very little of that done. And that's because the substrate, once we um, go into a container, then that substrate has to be very high performance to provide the right air and water balance all the time for a crop. And that substrate has to be lightweight to make it efficient to transport from the factory around the farm. And also for crops like tomatoes and strawberries, which are normally hung from the glass house or from the polytunnel rather than sitting on the floor, then that weight can collapse the whole support system if you're not careful, if it's too heavy. So typical bulk density for a substrate, so the weight of dry product per volume, is about 0.07 to 0.15 grams per cc. For a soil, we're talking about more than 10 times that often, one to one and a half. So you can see the substrate itself is very lightweight. But also, as I mentioned, to allow us to give us this little and often irrigation, we need a lot of pores. We need the ability for that substrate to hold a lot of water, but also a lot of air so that we keep the root system in good condition. And that enables us to equally um, irrigate it frequently, but also for the substrate to drain fast so that we don't stay over um, saturated for too long. So the typical porosity, the percentage of volume occupied by the pores and substrate is generally between 80 and 90 percent. The best soils with the best structure and we're lucky to get 45 to 50 percent. So you can see that substrates themselves have got their lighter in weight, they're basically able to hold more air, more water. And so we see that you know when you compare the soil with substrate we have this inverse relationship between bulk density and porosity. And you can see that the substrate is holding so much more water and air because of its low bulk density. And we normally say that a good substrate should be able to hold 45 to 80% of its volume as water and 10 to 35% of its volume as air. And we express that at what we call that container capacity, which I'll um, talk about in more detail later. But that's all about the state that it reaches after it's been irrigated to full point, to um, all the pores being full and allowing it to drain. And you can see we've got different substrates here. And you can see the water and air balance. And they all have slightly different properties in terms of their ability to hold water and air. And that's all about the size of the particles and the size of the pores, which is the spaces between those particles. And I'm going to talk to you about that in more detail so you can understand the difference between different substrate types and also how you can adjust the physical characteristics of a particular substrate to change this air water balance to make it suitable for different crops. So when we think of the common materials that are used for substrates. We've got them listed here and I'll, I'll go through them again um, briefly. So also it's important to think of, we have these materials, but what are their physical properties? So in this table, we've got their particle sizes, the percentage of particles for different substrates, at one millimeter, one to two, two to four, et cetera, different particle sizes. And we have, um, so the percentage in different brackets, you call them fine, medium, coarse, and also some of their physical properties. So we'll summarize that. We'll say, well, first of all, one of the most common substrates and the, the earliest of the um, widely used soilless growing media was peat. And particle sizes range anything from almost zero, fine, very fine dust, up to 25 or even 32 millimeters. 
Um, as we'll talk about later, it's often graded into different um, size bands and you can change the physical composition of your substrate by blending in different fractions. Density is typically 0.1 to 0.15 grams per cubic centimetre, porosity of 70 to 80%. Then we have Koya Pith, which in the sector that I operate in, is becoming the dominant substrate. It's taken over from peat for a variety of reasons. Some environmental, because within Northern Europe, there's a big reaction against using peat as a substrate. So when I first started growing the substrate, then it was all peat, and now there's virtually no peat. Partly for environmental reasons, but also we see that actually the physical structure of coir is better and the crops grow better than in most peat substrates. You can see that the particle size range is much smaller, only up to five millimetres. But despite that, we've got a lower density and a higher porosity. And people often say, well, how can that be? Well, that's because that, OK, you look at this and it says particles less than one millimetre. And for coir, it says 67 percent and peat here, it says 35. But actually, if you were then to take that less than one millimetre and grade into 0 to 0.5 and 0.5 to 1, you would probably see that the coir is mostly in the 0.5 to 1 millimetre, whereas the peat has a very large percentage of particles less than half a millimetre. And it's those very fine dust particles that effectively clog up some of the larger pores that make a big difference. We've got pine bark as well that's used for substrates and also used um, as a mulch in many applications. It can have large particle sizes up to 16 mil. It's a slightly heavier product. The bark itself is denser than a particle of peat or coir, so a slightly less lower porosity. Increasingly in Northern Europe, and I know in North America it's starting to come in then, processed wood fibre, and that can have particle size is up to about 10 millimetre. And like coir, it's a very light, airy material with a very high porosity. I worry that it doesn't actually have a very high lignin content. And so that means over um, a period of one or two years, it breaks down quite fast compared to, say, bark or um, coir. But for a short term use, then it's becoming quite popular because of its very a porous nature. And then we hear a lot about green waste, so composted food and garden waste. And um, I always worry about this when you look at the statistics on it. It's very dense material, four times, five times the density of others, and a fairly low porosity. It's it's a you know a lot of smaller particles and not um, a lot of cellulose, so a lot of um, less airy materials and it breaks down fairly fast to become even higher in its density and um, less porosity. So why are these substrates, with the exception say of green waste, so much more porous than soil? So it's about two things. First of all is the particle sizes, which we talked about before, and you probably know we classify soil and we have a soil textural triangle and we classify soils from very small clay particles, less than 0.002 millimetres, up to gravel, which is two millimetres and above. And you can see that we're working for clay, silt, and a lot of sands well below 0.1 of a millimetre. So very tiny particles. Substrate particles, as we said, are generally much larger. We classify anything below one millimetre as fine or dust. Small to medium particles in a one to four mils and large or coarse particles, four to 32 millimetres. So we've got a hundred times bigger particles generally. Also, the individual particles themselves are very different in their physical um, composition. So soil particles are generally fairly solid or fairly dense in structure. So a micrograph of a sand particle, you can see it's basically a bit of rock, very tiny bit of rock. Um, so sand or um, some of the finer silt and clay particles 
can also be aggregated together into crumbs, stuck together basically by the process of soil organic matter. And again, that's holding them quite close together. That's quite good to increase the overall size, but it means the particles themselves are quite dense. So when you look at substrate particles in an electron micrograph, you see that they're generally very hollow or porous, almost honeycomb in texture. So they basically consist of very little. If you were to grind that up into atom size, you'd be left with a tiny, tiny pile of material. They're mostly air. And when we use them in um, uh, our containers, then the individual particles don't aggregate together. They tend to be very loosely packed together, providing we haven't over compressed it. And so we've got very little dry mass, very loosely um, packed in a container. So any container substrate is far more lightweight, contains hardly any material and a lot of air when it's compared to the same container full of soil or sand. So that's how they have this great increased ability to hold water and air in the same volume in much larger quantities than soil. So this means it helps us a lot with our water management, which is the engine room, if you want to call it, of growing in substrate. And I want to think about how we manage the water for crop and compare soil and substrate as well. And we'll talk about irrigation strategies in more detail in the, in the next webinar, but it's important to understand how the water's behaving and the degree of tension that we want that water to be at. So our substrates, as we said, is lots of individual particles, different sizes, all loosely mixed together. And we can store air or water between those particles. And we have three critical states, as far as a plant's concerned, in that air-water balance. We have what we call the optimal zone, and we define that as at or just below container capacity. So this is a narrow band. There's lots of water available, but also good aeration. So we have good root health as well. And we see this if you irrigate a substrate or a soil, um, a container full of soil, and you allow that water to drain by gravity, um, or if rainfall falls and it drains by gravity, then once it's reached that steady state of all the gravitational water is drained away, then we call that container capacity. And we can measure that, and that's usually at what we call a moisture tension of minus one kilopascal. And I'm very careful, I haven't used the percentage moisture content because that can vary quite considerably according to the nature of the substrate, the particle sizes and the pore sizes. But it will always be at this particular tension. So the other important state to think about is, well, we can easily overdo the watering in substrate or in soil, and we can get saturation. So we've applied too much water or the water hasn't drained away very well because we've not left sufficient time for irrigating, or there's been a drainage restriction which has prevented it from being um, draining properly according to gravity. So in that situation, we have too little air um, and we get root dieback. And it's very easy to do that in soil and substrate in containerized growing if the drainage is poor or if our irrigation is too generous. And we can define that as a much lower moisture tension between zero and minus one kilopascal. Um, and then we can go the other way. If we go from container capacity around about minus one kilopascal and it starts to dry back, for the first little bit of the dry back, if you want to call it, so plants taking it up or some evaporating, then that's good. We're in that optimal zone. But as it dries back more and more, then we start to see too much air, not enough water, and we get to a tension that starts to reduce the yield and plant size. We see that the leaf size declines. We see some problems with potentially um, tip burn or some physical symptoms. But more importantly, before we see them, the plants starting to struggle to suck enough water in tension because of this 
miniaturized root system and it has an effect on the fruit size and the yield or the quality aspects of our crop. And if we allow it to dry out a bit more beyond that yield reduction, but where the plant can continue to extract water, and then we eventually get to a point where it becomes too difficult and we start to see wilting. And typically we say in substrate, that's around about minus 10 kilopascals. Well, you know yourself, it may be possible to bring the plant back from that wilt if it hasn't um, dried out too much. So we don't see death until we get to higher levels, minus 20. If we compare this with what happens in soil grown crops, you'll see that from literature, then often soil tensions are at levels that would really severely cause problems for our substrate grown crops. Typically, we talk about growing tomatoes at minus 10 to minus 50 kilopascals. That would kill the substrate grown crop. 10 times higher tension. And that's because these soil grown crops have this much larger surface area of roots. So they're much more efficient at extracting water. Basically, they've got much more suction power than a substrate grown crop has with a tiny root system and a big leaf area. So I've just come back to this idea of moisture tension and I'll link it to moisture content as we go through. It's quite important to understand that from a plant point of view, it's the tension that the water is held in those pores that's important, not necessarily the moisture content of the substrate itself. So I'll try and explain that as we go along. So we call moisture tension the suction force required for water molecules to be removed from the pores. And we're talking generally about them being removed by three different forces, gravitational drainage, plant water uptake, or capillary sideways movement. And the size of the pores within our substrate, so we call it the pore size distribution, that's directly related to the size, the diameter of the individual substrate particles, particle size distribution. And these pores dictate how strongly the water molecules are held. And they're held by the weak forces of adhesion and cohesion. And one of the easiest ways to understand similar forces are when you think of a thermometer, um, a narrow tube and mercury going up the thermometer. It doesn't suddenly drop when the water, uh, when the temperature changes slightly, it goes down. And that's because the progress both um, up and down is interfered with by these forces of adhesion of the mercury molecules to the outside and cohesion between the molecules. And we see the same forces working with water molecules inside a pore. And we see that the larger the pore, the weaker these forces are. So large substrate particles, more than one millimeter, have large pores. So they lose their water more easily. Smaller particles, they start to clog up the large pores. So if we have a lot of small particles in a substrate, even though we might have a lot of large particles, that's gonna have a big effect on the average pore size and have an effect on its water holding capability and the tension that water's held at. So you can classify pores for different sizes different diameters for their, um, how easily they lose water. And we talk about large pores, macro pores, more than 75 micrometers, and they lose their water very easily at low tension, so less than minus five kilopascals, which sounds familiar. I see that sounds like just the sort of level that we don't want our substrate crops to get exposed to any more than that. Medium-sized pores, they lose their water less easily at minus five to minus 10 kilopascals and small pores hold water more strongly. So they'll only lose their water at minus 10 kilopascals. And so you can see that it's only the largest pore sizes that are useful for our substrate growing crops. You can have a substrate with lots and lots of small fine particles and it can actually hold quite a lot of water 
but if the particles are very small, the pores are very small, and that water's held a, a tension, which is a bit too high. So even though it feels moist, it's too difficult for our substrate ground plant to extract enough water. And you can show how the water retention of any particular substrate is affected um, by the particle sizes by having these moisture retention curves. And we can then relate the moisture content to the tension that the water's held. And this, I'll come back to this example in the next slide, but we've got different substrates. Green is peat, um, red is coir, purple is bark. We've got pine bark and perla in here as well. But the important thing to remember is that we're aiming for our substrate grown plants to keep the moisture tension at around at minus one to minus five kilopascals. That's the perfect area. If it gets any higher the tension, it starts to interfere with the growth. So we want to be in this region here, you can see. We don't want it to, saturation is here and stress region is there. And we want to keep it in somewhere in the middle. And you can see for different substrates, that's different percentage moisture contents. And that's what I'm coming back to why we think tension first, and then we try and relate tension to moisture content. Because if we just work on moisture content all the time, we don't understand how available that water might be to plants growing in it, because we don't understand the physical nature of that substrate. So we can equate, as I say, tension to plant growth and the substrate moisture content in the following ways. So if we have this curve, which represents the growth rate of the plant, and then along the bottom, we've got the tension. So we have our ideal region, optimal for plant growth, between minus five, minus one and minus five kilopascals. We can easily go into substrate, into saturation zone. You can see how easy it is with a little bit more water, drops the tension to too low a level, not enough air, too much water. And we can go the other way. Um, if we dry out too much, we start to get into the stress wilt region, and that's gonna have an increasingly strong effect on our plants. So if we look at these moisture retention curves again, we can see the peat, the green curve, 60% moisture content at this minus one kilopascal tension. So that's where we'd like it to be 60% or a little bit drier. We don't want it to be down at 30% because that's gonna to be too dry. We don't necessarily want it up to 90% because it's gonna be saturated. The coir, the red curve, you can see at the same tension, we wanna keep that. That's gonna be around about 48%. And you can actually see it drops off quite quickly. Um, and the reason for the difference Essentially, it's not because it's inherently because it's peat or because it's coir, it's because of the particle sizes. And coir has fewer fine particles, so less small pores, so loses water a little bit more quickly. And that is quite good for managing the water content, but you can go too far in trying to have larger pores. And the purple curve bark is a good example. You can see it just loses its water really fast and at 25 is only 25% moisture at minus one kilopascals. So it's losing water far too easily, too thirsty you might want to call it for our crops. Because of the large particle size and the huge pore sizes, it just loses water far too rapidly to, for our um, crops to be able to get enough water um, to grow. So the important thing is these curves, it says bark, coir, peat, and some of these are pine waste, but actually that's just for that specific mix with that specific um, particle size distribution. And you could alter peat, coir, bark, etc., cetera, um, with, by changing the particle size distribution and produce quite different curves. And we'll talk about that in the next slide or two. So the important thing is that the measured moisture content at any particular tension level is all dependent on its particle size distribution. And when we talk about substrates, actually particle size is more important 
than the actual raw material itself. It, to a degree, doesn't make too much difference whether it's peat, coir, um, perlite, bark. If we have similar, exactly the same particle sizes, they'll perform in broadly similar ways. So in my particular area of expertise, if you want to call it, then um, we're looking for a substrate to be able to hold around about 40 to 65% of its moisture at a tension of minus one to minus four kilopascals. So this is the ideal region. So you can see the bark is too dry and the yellow one, which is a pine waste, is a bit too dry as well. Our peat and coir mixes pretty much fit in with the idealized version. So thinking about our different substrates, I'll take three basically. I'll take peat, coir and perlite and show you how you can make different products from the, that raw material. So if we think about peat, then the main raw material that goes into making a substrate is what we call surface filled sphagnum moss. And if I had time, I'd show you some nice pictures of peat bogs that are harrowed, and then this giant hoover comes along and sucks it all up into a big um, hopper, and that's taken off to the factory. And then what happens there, it's processed. And that surface milled sphagnum moss consists of particles of many sizes, 0 to 32 mils. Um, and what happens is that the peat is processed in the substrate factory by passing across different mesh screens. So and that separates it into different particle size fractions. Essentially, it's elevated to a very tall hopper, dropped down a tube, and there are different screens at different heights in the tube. The, the most coarse screen, as you can imagine at the top, and that takes off the really big lumps and then successively finer screens so that you can fractionate, you can um, separate the raw material into different size bands of particles, different fractions. And then those fractions can be blended to give you different substrates with different particle size distributions. So you often hear peat um, blends called either medium fine or medium coarse. And you can see a couple of examples here, with different particle size distributions for the different materials. And in most blends, a high proportion of fine and small fractions is used because the raw material itself has a very high percentage of these um, fine and small fractions and it would be wasteful to not to use them, but they're also help to retain a bit more water. But like I say, if the particles are too fine, all that happens is it clogs up the larger pores, and then we get lots of small pores, and that water's held at a tension which is too high for plants to get to under, uh, to keep them growing under optimal conditions, because our plants have this miniaturized root system in a big leaf area, and they can't really don't have the suction power to cope with high moisture tension. So if we want to make a coarser, more free draining substrate from peat, generally they add a larger percentage of the larger coarse fractions that keep some of the smaller particles. And often you hear quoted, you call, you call it the air fill porosity. And that's an idea of how free draining the mix is, how much air, the percentage of pore space remaining, at container capacity. And so for different mixes, you might see different figures. And typically for finer seedling mixes, then we talk about nine to 12 percent. Pot plants and bedding plants a little bit higher, 10 to 15. For strawberries, we always used to say we need 14 to 18 percent or even a little bit more. Raspberries a bit more and for nursery stock and salad crops a little bit higher, ideally. Um, particularly for salads, more like 25%. So you can play around with the particle size distribution by mixing different fractions together, but you'll see there's always a fair bit of this fine material in surface mill peat um, because of the way it's housed. When we think of coir-based substrate, then obviously a different process. 
we make it from a mix of two or sometimes three different raw materials from coconut husks. So the coconuts are taken from the tree, they're split, as you know, and then the nut is removed from the inside. And then we have the two halves of the husk that um, can be processed. And usually there's a process of what we call decortification, which means separating out all the fibers that are in that um, husk and um, then also the dust that's in there, which I'll come to. So from a horticultural substrate point of view, then you can extract a lot of fiber from the husk and most of that goes into ropes and um, uh, textiles of some description. The thinnest and the shortest fiber, 20 to 35 millimeters in length, around about a millimeter in diameter, and that's only a few percent of the total amount of fiber and husk, we use in substrates. And we use it anything from 10 to 35, I've even heard of 40% fiber in some mixes. And the idea of this fiber is those fibers themselves are hollow tubes. And when you mix them in with a substrate, it can be peat or coir or any other material, the water travels along the hollow tubes. So it's great for helping to spread the water laterally in any substrate. So it's great for improving the sideways lateral movement of water. It does also reduce the water holding capacity because it's not so porous in nature. And then you have the pith. So when you extract the five, you generally get 50% fiber and 50% pith, which is the dust left over from the fiber extraction process from any one husk. And as I say, most of the fiber is too thick and too coarse for horticultural substrates. And again, with pith, we often see with this dust, it's not all 100% suitable. So it consists mainly of particles of 0 to 5 millimetres, has a high water and air holding capacity and easy to be wet, but there is some very fine material in there, and that can be removed as well. And we'll talk about that a bit later. There's another way of processing husks um, by milling it or chopping it into chunks. These are often called chips. And so coir chips basically are fibre and pith all mixed in a little chunk. It's been put through a mill and rather than um, the fibre and pith being separated, it's, the whole thing is still mixed together, chopped into small um, chunks, five to 15 millimetres is common. For some things like orchids, they even use larger chips. So the idea is these have got much bigger particle sizes. So gives you more large pores, less water retention. And for many crops, you hear people talking about adding some coir chips to their mix to give more air, less water retention. And the good thing about chips is that they are very stable over a number of years. So for longer term crops, it's quite useful that they you can add them to a substrate and in two or three years time, they'll still be having a similar effect. There's another process which can turn um, coir husks into slightly smaller chips, ultra chips they're called, two to five millimetres in size. And some strawberry producers say that the bigger chips are too coarse and free draining and they don't get good mixing of the very large chips with the coir pith. So they make these smaller chips to mix in with coir pith and that makes a better, more homogenous mix. So they give um, slightly better longevity, slightly better water retention than um, better longevity than if you just have pith, but better water retention than if you mix pith with these large coir chips. So you can also, like they do with peat, start to say, well, how can we play around with the air and water holding capacity in our coir substrate? So you can adjust the particle sizes. So as I mentioned before, unprocessed coir pith has got lots of fine particles. And if you remove all the particles less than one millimeter by sieving, then the moisture retention drops from about 80% down to about 65%. And if you take out all the particles below two millimeters by sieving, the moisture retention drops to less than 40% because you're 
pore sizes are getting larger and larger because the spaces between the pores are larger as the particles get bigger and there's fewer fine particles clogging up um, the larger spaces anyway. You can also add extra fiber. As I say, that's quite a common technique that's used for a lot of salad crops. We go from 10 to 30% and that reduces the water holding capacity. But that's a relatively short lived benefit because the fibers themselves do degrade over time. So it's common um, strategy used for one season salad crops like tomatoes and cucumbers, but not necessarily a, the best way of approaching a long term crop. That's usually achieved by adding these chips. So larger particle sizes, more stability, um, gives you that higher air, less moisture retention over a longer period of time. And so typically we see for different blends of coir, with different uses, we see a slight change in the composition and their moisture holding capacity. So for the very finest materials used for seedlings, it's pretty much 100% pith, maybe a tiny bit of fibre mixed in, and that can hold 60-75% moisture at um, container capacity. Down to once we start to move into strawberries for a one season crop, we start to add a bit more fibre and slightly lower the water holding capacity. For a two or three season crop, we might start putting some chips in. Um, for cannabis, which is, needs a, a slightly drier growing situation, then a mix of fibre and chips. And for the salad veg, then adding lots of fibre is cheap and can reduce the water holding capacity and you don't need that to last for a long time. So these are typical mixes, but um, what you'll find is many different substrate producers have their own ideas of how to get that right blend of air and moisture, but this is a typical way that it's done. As I mentioned, a lot of coir suppliers are now screening, sieving their product and with most of the pith particles below two millimeters removed. And this gives that substrate a longer working life than an unscreened product, a two to three season product, but better moisture retention than just by adding fiber. So those sieve products are coming through now and um, are quite popular for strawberries and raspberries in particular. Finally, we'll talk about how um, perlite can be added to substrate mixes. So, as you probably know, perlite is an expanded volcanic material, forms white aggregates, particles, and often for substrates, they use what we call medium grade horticultural material, two to five millimeter particle size. And like our organic substrates, the water is held in those pore spaces between the aggregates, not within the aggregates themselves. So it's a bit like ultra chips or small chips. It adds a lot of large particles, a lot of um, large pores as a result. So generally adding perlite to substrates reduces its water holding capacity, particularly if it's a substrate that's got a lot of fine particles in. And so as you can see from this work that was done, we're adding going from 100% peat to 75 25% peat perlite to 50-50, you can see that the water retention is reduced as you add more peat perlite. And we took around about two and a half kilopascals, which is the sort of nice reason that we'd like our plants to be grown at. Then the water retention goes from 60% or a bit more in 100% peat to less than 45%. So it's we're changing the water holding capacity of our substrate by adding perlite to it, mainly because we're changing the particle size, therefore the pore size distribution. But perlite has some other advantages. Unlike organic substrate materials, then the perlite aggregates are physically very stable. They don't break down, they don't decompose by microbial decomposition. There's no carbon and nitrogen in there to, um, for microbes to feed on to break them down. So they don't decompose over time. So if you add a 10 or 20 or 25% inclusion to your substrate, 
you're still going to see that perlite there in three, four, five years time. So for longer term crops, things like blueberries and trees, then that's quite a useful thing to have. Then you're, you're pretty confident that that substrate is not going to lose so much of its structural um, integrity with microbial decomposition over time. Perlite also has very little what we call cation exchange capacity. That means it, a substrate that has a lot of perlite in doesn't retain so many nutrients. And that's quite good because over time with most substrates, they tend to absorb more and more nutrients and the EC becomes more difficult to control and can then become needing a lot of flushing, otherwise it gets too high. If you add perlite to it, you don't have to do so much flushing because it hasn't got that same ability to hold on to nutrients. So adding perlite is quite a good thing for our long-term crops. It does add a bit of cost. Um, I sometimes see people adding perlite to substrates which have got a lot of fine material in. And I think that's quite good for year one. But when you have a product um, like blueberries or even raspberries or other crops there, you're expecting a three or four year life or even 10 years, then I don't believe that's the right solution. If you've got lots of fine material in, then over time that's going to get even finer and really going to clog up the pores. So although adding perlite might help in the first year or so, over time it's going to be completely swamped by the large amount of fine pores that are already present. So I think the best solution is to grade out some of those finer particles and then if you want to add a bit more perlite on top of that. So that's my run through on substrates. Um, I'm hoping you found that useful and interesting and I'm happy to take any questions that might arise from that. Yeah, that was great, Dennis. Thank you. Um, Sunny, why don't we see what's up with our questions? We've got a few questions that have come through. Uh, first is from uh, Michael. For clock. For a crop like blueberries, would you recommend a moisture tension of a minus one to minus five throughout the whole growing season or just in the uh, few weeks leading up to harvest? That'll be um, that, I mean, that's a good question. Um, we typically will run them. Um, what you tend to find is early in the year, crop like blueberries might flower when it's got no leaves. And so the um, demand, the water demand of that plant is fairly low. So you can run it at the higher tensions because you're not really asking too much of that plant. You can even run it maybe a bit higher, minus five, minus six kilopascals. Once it starts to leaf up, then the water demand increases and that's when you have to bring the tension down a little bit. And so normally we would be operating between those tensions, between minus one and minus four to minus five, once we start to see the leaf area expanding and the um, ET demand, the evaporation, transpiration demand of that crop increasing. And there's a general rule that the hotter it is, the lower the tension wants to be because the plant's under a lot more stress. And clearly during the fruiting phase, then we want to maximize fruit size. So we want to keep it at the, at the lower end of that range for sure, yes. Post harvest again, then the northern um, hybrid blueberries, then they're usually doing a little bit of flower initiation, but they're not doing a great deal of growing. So again, we can let the tension rise a little bit to the sort of higher end of that range. But I don't like to go much higher than minus five, minus six kilopascals. I think that covers that. Um, what's the lifespan of each? type of product and of course it depends on the quality but generally if you're looking to keep a crop for many years versus a short-term crop uh, yeah well the best example you can probably say is, is a crop like blueberries you know I've got growers who've been growing in the same substrate now for 10 years um, and it's really important with a crop like blueberries that you have the right substrate with the right resilience you know, enough chips, enough perlite, so it doesn't break down. Um, 
And so I think it's possible to have a 10 year substrate. If you've got a, lot, a product with a lot of fine material, you're gonna find it very difficult to manage. It's gonna hold a lot of water and a lot of fertilizer after one season. And then it's just gonna be difficult to manage for the remainder of the time that you have that crop. So, you know, basically the, the, the general rule is the finer the material you start with, the shorter it's working life. And a product with a lot of fine material, if you can get one season out of it, um, you know, you, you're all well and good, but don't take the risk in running it into a second season. With the coarser, more open products, then, you know, they're usually a little bit more challenging in the first season or two because they do, they are that bit more thirsty, but they're going to stand you in much greater stead over the, over the while. With all substrates, any crop, you know, with each passing year, then more of the pores get filled with roots. There's this steady decomposition that's going on of the organic material, and there's probably a little bit of compaction as well. So it's losing porosity as with each passing year. So the better and more porous material you start off with, obviously, the, um, the longer it's going to last. So can you get a buildup of root diseases in some of those poorly drained situations? Yeah, well, you can have two issues, really. And, um, you know, I, I'm hoping maybe in the second webinar we'll cover this. You can either have just water logging, which is not necessarily root disease. It's just root dieback. And that's not uncommon. You know, we can see people often say, oh, I've got root disease. When you test them, they haven't got root disease. They've just been waterlogged. And so the roots died from the asphyxiation. But clearly, if you've got a very wet substrate, then the risk of diseases is that much higher, for sure. Yeah. The raspberries, you uh, threw out a number of, uh, I think it was 3.5 liters of substrate in a pot. Mm -hmm. Growing something like strawberries, that's different uh, substrate volume. Yeah, I mean, strawberries, it's not untypical to say we have around about 15 to 20 liters per linear meter. And we might have anything from eight to 12 plants per linear meter. So one to two liters per plant is not uncommon for strawberries. Uh, we had another question come through from Sarah. Uh, what is uh, typically done with substrate once it is beyond uh, its uh, useful life? Yeah, I mean, that's a superb question. Um, so it's actually a very good resource for many, a variety of purposes. So I've got growers, you know, um, more than one of my growers might buy three, 400,000 um, slabs each year. And so that's a quite a big waste disposal issue, if you want to call it. Even if you keep them for two or three years, you've still got 100,000 or more to dispose of each year. And so there's various things that people can do. Um, this particular grower has a lot of apples and he puts a substrate around his apple trees to try and, and kiwi berries. Um, that helps conserve moisture. It also helps attract weeds as well, I'd say. So um, it's not all, it's all good, but it's a really good soil amendment for soil grown crops. And um, arable farmers are always keen to take it if you can deliver it to them. The issue is the transport usually. With all these bulky materials, then the costs and the um, time involved in transport can be quite considerable. So that makes it, you know, what on paper looks very attractive to be practically a little bit more tricky. So I have growers who have arrangements with um, local farmers to take the product. Some spread it on their land. Um, the, the one or two people dry it and burn it. Um, it, you have to manage the moisture content very carefully, but it is possible um, to use it in biomass boilers if you get the moisture content down sufficiently. Okay. So thinking about a crop like uh, blueberry, it comes mm -hmm. to the end of your 10 years, the plant goes to, yeah. is it not? Yeah, just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, and what we often do, you can process a substrate. So it's not uncommon for raspberries and black um, and blackberries and strawberries where we actually process it so it's taken into a chopper 
So you end up with a, you know, if you want to call it a, a you know, a fine mix, a mulch really, that can be either used as a mulch on the soil, spread on um, and ploughed into soil. Some people try to then reuse that for growing plants and substrate. You've got the diseased risk and also you tend to create a lot of fine material. So it's not quite as um, physically suitable as a fresh material. Another question, uh, what is the baseline uh, nutrient level in substrate? I mean, that varies from crop to crop. Um, interestingly, when for many years we grew strawberries in peat and, and we were told by the substrate manufacturers that you need to have some base fertilizer in them. And we always found that, you know, I'm, I'm sure you don't, but anyway, they said, yes, you do. Um, and with coir, we don't add any base fertilizer to it. We might um, change the cation balance by trying to um, buffer it, which means you know trying to exchange some of the potassium and sodium for calcium, but not specifically adding any baseline fertilizer to it. So it depends on the crop. Um, but for drip irrigated crops, then I tend to think you're better off having as little fertilizer in it to start with as possible, because you can always add. Um, what we found often with strawberry grow bags um, with peat substrate many years ago, when we started irrigating, the drain came out very high EC because all that fertilizer that had been added was just being washed out. So clearly that was basically being wasted. Um, there are some crops, I mean, obviously, if you're not dripping, you're, you're growing in pots or um, crop, then there may be some merit to adding um, a low amount of base fertilizer, but I tend to favor relatively low amounts of base fertilizer, and I'd rather the grower put on his own, either through drip or overhead sprinklers or flood irrigation if they're doing it in benches or whatever, and control it that way. That's my general philosophy. I see more problems with substrate coming with, loaded with too much fertilizer and, and then small plants struggling to grow than the other way around. So the, the background substrate itself, there is a little bit of fertilizer in there, depending on which type you, you're uh, using. Yeah, so peat generally has lime added to it to bring the pH. The, the raw pH of, of peat substrate is generally about three to four. So usually calcium, magnesium, limestone is added to bring the pH up. So there's some calcium and magnesium from that. And then often it has a small amount of base fertilizer, which can be varied. Um, Coir substrate generally only has what's in there, which is um, potassium, boron often, um, and whatever exchange has happened between the naturally occurring potassium and sodium that's in the coconut and the, um, the buffering process that's been done by the substrate manufacturer, heading basically flooding it with calcium nitrate and then washing it afterwards. And the idea is that some of that calcium then stays in the substrate and it's exchanged with some of the naturally high levels of potassium and sodium that are present on the coir. Something like perlite has nothing in, something like bark has probably very little in, um, and um, green waste has got a whole load of stuff in that you don't want to know about. Uh, we're getting uh, towards the end of the list of questions. If there's more questions, uh, please free feel, to, uh, feel free to ask. Yep. If, if you have a uh, compressed brick of uh, cocoa product and mm -hmm. you start, start, of course, by hydrating it, mm -hmm. uh, do you start right in with your fertilizer fertigation recipe or some people talk about flushing it with uh, calcium nitrate first? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's important to understand what um, chemical status that coir a cocoa block arrives at your farm on. You can buy cocoa blocks either buffered, so the calcium nitrate has already been added in the processing plant, or you can buy it, you can buy it as you know, unbuffered, in which case then it's a good idea for you to add calcium nitrate and buffer it yourself. So there's, you sort of have to make a distinction between whether it's buffered or unbuffered, but generally with coir um, growing, it has a high potassium level and a relatively low calcium level, even when it's been you know, treated, buffered as they call it, um, by the processor. 
So normally when I'm wetting it up, I would probably wet up with some dilute calcium nitrate solution. Yes. Um, but you need to use a lot more if it hasn't already been buffered. Really, you need a, we, we have a buffering process, which is where you actually add, before you plant into it, you add a very high EC solution of calcium nitrate. And then you wash that through with plain water afterwards to try and get that exchange process occurring. If it's already had that done in the processing before you buy it, then probably just wetting up with a dilute calcium nitrate solution is fine. Um, I have a question here from uh, Jackson. Uh, you mentioned uh, about uh, using the substrate after you've uh, finished with it in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. He was wondering if uh, stored over time, can it be used in uh, strawberry production? And uh, if there's any concerns about that. Yeah. So this is um, substrate that's been used, what, for say tomatoes or something like that? Is that the sort of... Uh, let, where let, the question's let, coming from. <laughs> let's assume first that uh, it's Has a it strawberry inside yeah. and he wants to grow strawberries outside. Okay, yeah. Then there's a high risk of replant disease there, clearly. Um, you know, there could be some diseases that have um, been present in your strawberry crop and then when you replant them. Um, I mean, we quite often with commercial strawberry production, we'll reuse coir substrate for at least one, uh, two growing cycles. Usually we plant them and after a year, you know, the end of the first year with a day neutral plant, for example, we might pull that out at the end of that first year and then replant the same substrate, the same bag or trough the following year. And providing you haven't had too much of a disease risk in the first um, cycle then that works quite well. Storing them for a while then you just have to be careful you know what's gone on in that storage process. You know, if there has been some disease or if there has been some pest like vine weevil that creeps in or you know they've been subject to any um, exposure to any chemicals or anything you just have to be a little bit careful that you know that it hasn't degraded further. Um, we, we see that we've done lots and lots of trials where we compare planting to fresh material with planting to once used and even twice used substrate in strawberries. And we generally see between 10 and 25% yield reduction for um, going from fresh material to once used and up to 35% yield reduction going between fresh material and twice used substrate. So then you've got an economic calculation to make. You have to decide the money you saved in substrate, is that paid for by, you know, or is that more that you've saved than the loss in yield? And generally, I would say it's not. Uh, you only need a few percent drop in yield and you've been better off to buy substrate, uh, fresh substrate. So I'm not a great fan of reusing substrate, but I also accept that cash flow sometimes is pretty difficult to sustain if you're having to keep buying new substrate all the time. And some people elect to replant a proportion of their uh, crop each year for cash flow reasons. And, you know, that's perfectly, if they, if they know what they're doing, then that's fine. So your other thought was uh, rotating crops within that substrate. Maybe you can finish your uh, thought, thought process there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, again, you have to be careful going from a tomato grow bag into a, a strawberry. Tomato's probably been grown at much higher EC. The mix has probably got more fibre, which could degrade more rapidly. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful of that, I think. Um, you have to check that, you know, um, the substrate isn't still loaded with very high EC um, and that it's still, you know, got a reasonable physical... Um, nature. Whenever we reuse substrate, we try and break up and aerate the old substrate. And that's quite easy if it's in a grow bag situation. It was, if it's in a solid pot or something, that's much more difficult to achieve. Um, next question is, uh, relatively speaking, how do these products tend to compare in uh, price? Ooh, I mean, that's difficult. I, I imagine that 
in where you are, peat would be the cheaper material for sure. Um, coir, I'm told in North America, is much more expensive than it is in Europe, and I, I think that's just a, um, a sort of, uh, you know, a, 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 a volume thing really. There's probably more volume of coir coming into Europe, so the transport costs are cheaper. I don't, or maybe the people that are selling coir are making more margin from North America than they are from Europe. I don't actually see why it should be more expensive. Um, because the transport distance is probably not much difference, I wouldn't have thought, um, from Sri Lanka to to the UK and Sri Lanka to the, you know, Halifax or, or somewhere similar. Um, so coir is peat's cheaper material. Wood waste is becoming quite cheap in Northern Europe. I'm not quite sure what it is in um, in North America. Speaking um, a while ago, talking to some growers in North Carolina, they've got a huge amount of bark material um, that they use and, and they can grade that into different size fractions and different ages and that's the cheap material. So we spent quite a long time with them talking about, you know, they said we've got this huge cheap resource physically and chemically what we need to do to get it to the right um, constituency to grow raspberries in at that time. So, you know, that's, but for sure, peat is the cheaper material. All I can say is that in 20 years of starting to work with coir, I've not had one grower that's moved from peat to coir and wants to move back to peat. So there must be something in that. <laughs> partly environmental, but partly because they see better growth. They see better root development. And so, you know, there's, there's a, there is a physical factor in the strawberry crop. It may be different than other crops. Um, and maybe this will be the uh, last question. Um, are there additional uh, challenges uh, using organic growing methods in substrate? Well, the additional challenge in Northern Europe is you're not allowed. <laughs> um, I know in North America you can. The main challenge is nutrition. Um, so you can you can use organic um, plant or fish um, fertilizers, but usually they, in terms of their composition, they're not ideal for growing in substrate. They often have quite high levels of sodium and chloride. The pH um, is quite high, and the trace elements, iron, manganese etc can get locked up more easy so it's more challenging to grow um, in substrate organically because not of the substrate but because of the range of fertilizers that you can use um, but for sure you know working with um, a couple of organizations they do a lot of organic substrate production you know, which as i say growers in europe look at and can't understand how they can get away with it <laughs> so i guess that brings up another question how come they're not allowed the organic movement in Europe says organic means looking after the soil. And so if you're going to, and, and as you know, organic is not, it's more of a trademark than anything else. And so the, the trademark in Europe is that it's grown in soil and it's grown in healthy soil that's, you know, um, been properly looked after from the organic matter and the bioflora, you know, it's very, um, holistic way of looking at it. I'm trying to be um, diplomatic about what I, what I say, but yeah, so they, they don't accept that taking plants out of soil is an organic production system. So. All right, that's great. Thank you so much, Dennis and Sunny. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here quickly. That is good for that. Um, and then stay tuned for our next session that is happening Friday, April 9th, uh, same time from 11 to 1230. And we're going to talk about actually um, managing the irrigation in your soilless system. So thank you so much, Dennis, Sunny, and everybody for attending. And we will see you in April. Bye, guys.